Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to another holy and blessed Sabbath day, and I thank you for joining me in God's Cathedral of Time. As we come together again this morning, as we usually do from week to week, week after week, we come to lift up the name of Jesus Christ because he is the only Savior of the world. You that have been traveling with us know that we have talked about the prophecies, looked at what God had predicted, yea, through the ages down to where we are at this very moment in Earth's history. And we have also talked about God's Sabbath and how important God's Sabbath is to him and that he requires all of his people to, to keep his Sabbath. And we've been sharing with you from the word of God that as we come to the end of Earth's history that there would be a, a tectonic struggle between God's law and the tradition of men. We shared with you who was the one that attempted, yes, attempted to change God's Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And then we talked uh, about the crisis uh, ahead and how we may be prepared and where we ought to put our trust and we ought to put our trust in Christ Jesus and not in any human instrument. And last week we talked about the fact of every human being having a desire for eternal life and showed you from the word of God again what the Bible teaches about the dead as opposed to what is being taught in, in the world. And I pray that you all have been uh, received the blessing and will continue to do so as we move into today's study. Today's study is entitled very simply, The Gospel, uh, The Gospel. And let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your great love and your the grace and your mercy towards us. We thank you for Jesus, for sending him that we may have a right back to the tree of life. And we pray today that as we lift him up, that someone may see him and be drawn closer to him and be saved in your eternal kingdom. Leave it your manservant. Leave it those that are tuning in, those that are present in this uh, sanctuary we have. And we pray that, dear Lord, as a result of our meeting today, that we all would be drawn closer to thee and ultimately be saved in your kingdom. Is my prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I have in my hand here a book, and most of you know it as a Bible. I want you to know that the, uh, the Bible, the Bible is a precious book. It is a unique book. It is a book like no other book. As a matter of fact, it's a collection of, over, of 66 uh, books. The Bible, my dear brothers and sisters, it's not only a precious book, it's a powerful book. It makes the drunkard sober. It takes the liar and makes him honest and truthful. It takes the, the lady of the night and makes her a jewel in the crown of its author. It makes the profligate honest. The Bible has been translated into more languages than any other book in the world. More languages? and more dialects. The Bible explains itself, and as I've been sharing with you from week to week, we need not heed the, the, the doctrines of, of men. Oh yes, could you listen to a pastor, or a preacher, or a teacher? There's nothing wrong with that. But you need to go and check them out by the book, the Bible. The Bible, my brothers and sisters, explains itself. It is the very word of God. All human teachings and men's traditions are subordinate to the word of God. The Bible needs no man's philosophy, his theology, or his ideology to comprehend its teachings. I just pick it up and ask the Holy Spirit to, to teach you and to guide you because we're told that the Holy Spirit would guide us into, into all truth. The Bible's teachings are applicable to, to every class. Whether you're a Christian, a, a Hindu, a Buddhist, whether you're an atheist, the teachings of the Bible is applicable to every class and to every culture. The Bible's is timeless. His nature is beyond 
the existence of man. One writer wrote uh, during the Dark Ages, at the time when the Bible was banned and you were not able to, to read the Bible, you were killed for the Bible, he says that the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. In other words, an anvil is a, it's a tool that the blacksmith used to, to form the, his different uh, ornaments or jewels or what have you. It is used to, to make the horseshoes and to put them in the right shape, those of you that are familiar with that type of thing. And the writer is saying that the anvil would work out, would bear out, would be worn out before the Bible. The Bible, God declares in the Bible, that the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but my word shall last forever. In the Bible, we find the, the greatest story that was ever told. It's the story of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells of his pre-existence, his, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his sacrificial death on Calvary's cross. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, his resurrection from the tomb, his bodily, physical resurrection. They haven't yet produced a body after almost 2,000 years. The Bible talks about his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Oh, yes, you don't need to go to a man in a confessional booth. Jesus says, come on to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Paul tells us that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of God, the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find a grace to help in a time of need. I don't know about you, but I need the grace of Jesus even now. You see, the story of the Bible, the gospel, the gospel has changed nations more than any legislative edict could or will ever do. The Bible, more than any psychological tenet, changes the human heart from wickedness to righteousness. The Bible, brothers and sisters, more than any political instrument, has led nations has led nations to live in a manner that pleased God. Those nations that reject the Bible, they ultimately experience chaos, confusion, and debauchery. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to know this morning that the Bible, it's a book that ennobles the character, it, it refines the taste, and it purifies the thoughts and enriches the soul. The Bible. The Bible presents to us the gospel. But what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of the uh, restoration of fallen man back into the image of God, their creator. And in this time in which we live, what the world needs to see is the evidence of the gospel. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, I have nothing against my politicians and, uh, and what they're trying to do in their own spheres to hopefully make things better. But I, I want you to know this morning that Trump can't help you, that Biden can't help you, and anyone else that comes along, they can't. It is only, it is only the book that presents the gospel that could help you brothers and sisters, Amen. in this day of peril and uncertainty. The Bible remains the only solid foundation upon which you could stand, upon which I could stand. I pray that you would choose the Bible. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible gives us the truest, the most accurate account of the human experience here on planet Earth. 
And what the Bible does that distinguishes it from any other book that has ever been, raised, uh, has been written is to give us an account of what will happen in the future. And those of us, those of you that have been with us, you've seen where we've gone through the prophecies and traced the prophetic record all the way down from the time of Daniel in Babylonian captivity to the time in which we live. And you see the uncanny accuracy with which it all will be, it has been fulfilled. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to share a quotation with you as we continue this morning. It comes from a book entitled Education, and it's written by a 19th century Bible commentator, my favorite, her name is Ellen G. White. Amen. And this is what she writes. The central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan. The, redemp the restoration in the human soul to the image of God. We know it as the gospel. From the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden to the last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. The burden of every book, every writer, and the Bible and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of, the, of this wondrous theme, man's uplifting, the, the power of God, which giveth us victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The essence of the Bible is the gospel. So when someone tells you that they're a New Testament Christian and they don't want to study the Old Testament, run swiftly in the other direction because our Lord and Savior, Jesus says, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. We need to be Bible-believing Christians. According to the Bible, the restoration of God's image in man is called salvation. Uh, there are a lot that promise salvation. I mentioned some of them last week. I'm not going to go over that, but that's what every religion uh, promises. Salvation. Salvation from death. But according to my Bible, the only one that could do that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he is the gospel. He is the good news, and it is presented in his book, the good book. You need to read it. Take this time of shelter in place, this time that you're not able to go out and to associate and do all the other things that you were able to do. Take time to get to know Jesus. Get time to understand the gospel. Give the Lord an opportunity to to change your life, to transform you back into his image. As we open the Bible, we see the story of creation. Oh, when the devil has come along that you don't need creation. Man has gotten so wise that they have cast aside creation and in the process, the God of creation in the process, and they have adopted evolution. And evolution has brought us to where we are today. That's the evidence of evolution, brothers and sisters. Crime and even the things that are happening in the natural elements. Oh yes, it's evolution. Children disrespecting their parents. Men being cruel, man's inhumanity to man. Oh yes, hatred, division, divisiveness. Oh yes, the fruit of, elevate, of, of evolution. But the story of creation is quite the opposite. As the Bible opens up and gives us the story of creation, it tells us of the beautiful world that God had created and the beautiful 
fruits and, and, and flowers and the stars and the moon and everything else that he had provided for us. What a wonderful God that we serve. He made sure we had everything that we needed. And then he brought us into existence. And this is how the record goes. It says, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image and God created him. Male and female created he them. And just in case, just in case you are wondering who that us is that the Bible talks about, I praise God for the Bible because it explains itself. Jesus, Jesus after he had finished his ministry on planet earth and he called his disciples to pray, to pray for them and to pray for us that would come after him in the book of John chapter 17, Jesus declared in his prayer, for the disciples back then, and for you and us today, yea, verily, you not that might be listening, Jesus declared that they all, that they all, thou Father, may be one as I in me, as I in thee, and thou in me, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, oh yes, Jesus, from the very beginning, he told his father that he had accomplished the work, that men's lives have been transformed. My dear brothers and sisters, you see, as we come to these closing scenes of Earth's history, God is looking for men and women to reflect his character to a doom and dying world. And what is that character? In the book of Exodus chapter 34 when Moses went up into the mountain and he asked God to show him his glory, his glory, which is his character. And the Bible records and the Lord passed by before him, Moses, and declared the Lord. The Lord God, merciful, and gracious, long-suffering, and abundance in goodness and truth. That's what, who God is. And that's how we were created with the image of God. The psalmist David would continue. He says that the Lord is merciful and, and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. But sin has turned us around. And thank God for the gospel, because the gospel has been given to turn us back to Jesus, to turn us back to God, to make us back like God. David continues, but thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. I don't know about you, but the Lord is still working with me because I was not like that, but he gave me a promise that he is giving to you today. He who has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus. It is my desire to become more and more like Jesus, to be restored into that image in which we were created. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, as we read the good book, we see the image of God being reflected in his servants, he, he took Jesus when he came and walked on this earth. He took what society would have considered the lowest class with no hope. Fishermen, foul-mouthed Peter. James and John, the, the, the bullies, called them the sons of thunder. He took the thief, the, the, the tax collector, men that were degraded in their characters. And Jesus, the gospel, 
when they embraced the gospel, their lives were changed and it's a testimony to you and I today that the gospel works. My dear brothers and sisters, sin has separated us from God. The Bible describes sin as whosoever committed sin transgressed his law for sin is the transgression of the law. Jesus didn't come to redeem us from the law. He came to redeem us from sin. So when some preacher tells you that Jesus came and died on Calvary's cross so you don't have to keep the law, then you need to run in the opposite direction. Because Jesus didn't come to deliver us from the law. He came to deliver us from the penalty of the law, which is sin. The Bible teaches that his law is everlasting and everlasting. The psalmist David writes in Psalm 119 and 142 and 172, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Why wouldn't you want righteousness? Jesus is the only righteous one, so how could you claim to accept him and by the same token reject his law? That's insanity, but of course, the devil is insane, and he has inspired or told millions to follow him in his insanity. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Apostle Paul in Romans 3 and 23. But thank God for the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Today, we're talking about the gospel, the good news of redemption, the good news of restoration from our fallen image back into the image of God, the angel. The angel told Joseph, the estranged husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she was found with child. He says, Fear not thou, Joseph, to take Mary for thy wife. And he says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save the people from their sin. The gospel, the good news. You see, when Adam and Eve first sinned, or first parents, they were created in perfection with the image of God, but then sin came into the picture, sin, the disobeying of God's word. God told them of every tree in the garden you could eat there, but of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of good and evil. Some people say it's an apple. I don't know what it is. The Bible doesn't tell me, and it really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that they disobeyed God Amen. and brought sin into the world. And Jesus, the Jesus came down and he met with them and he, he decided to conduct an investigation. You see, I love the way that God operates. He just doesn't condemn us. He gives us an opportunity to defend ourselves. And so he came down to our first parents, and the Bible records that he began to do an investigation. And part of that investigation, he declared in the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis chapter 3, the book of Genesis chapter 3, and the Bible declares in verse 10, and he said, I heard that voice in the garden. This is Adam that is, is speaking. And I heard a voice in the garden. And I heard a voice in the garden, the Bible says in verse 10. And I was afraid because I was naked and I had hid myself. And he said, God now begin to 
conduct the investigation. Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree that I told thee not to eat of? The Bible continues, and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me, she gave me the tree. The, she gave me to eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. So before God pronounced the punishment, the judgment, as it were, he conducted an investigation, and as we come to uh, as we come to um, uh, Genesis chapter three and verse fifteen, as we come to Genesis chapter three and, and verse fifteen, we now find this record as God now pronounced the judgment. The Bible reads. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The introduction of the gospel, that there would be a great controversy. And that beyond the great controversy, that redemption would come. And so as we Move on, Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. You see, in order for the coats of skins to be made, an animal had to be slaughtered. That animal, that animal represented Jesus Christ. That animal represented the gospel because without the shedding of blood, the Apostle Paul tells us that there is no, there is no remission of sins. I want you to know of this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, the gospel has been from everlasting to everlasting. As we come to the book of Revelation, there we see the gospel introduced in the book of Genesis. We talked of the fact that it is the, 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 the theme of every passage, every story, every book of the Bible. And as we come to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, which brings us down to the time in which we live. The Apostle John, in prophetic vision, in prophetic vision, saw that this power would, would arise. This power under the influence of the devil himself, that he would come against God's people. And John, in wonderment, in wonderment, John is looking around in amazement, and he's trying to determine who would be able to stand, who would be able to fight against this power. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, we see John records to us in Revelation 13 and verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Oh yes, we're talking about the gospel from everlasting to everlasting, from the foundation of the world, I love the way that the Apostle Paul first was persecuting the church and then turned to be an advocate of the gospel and he declared to us, declared to the Corinthians and declared to us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, of verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came, and I, brethren, when I came, when I came unto you, I came not with the excellency of speech or with wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything but Jesus Christ and him are crucified. My dear brothers and sisters, oh, the gospel, 
the gospel, brothers and Amen. sisters, Amen. the gospel of our only hope. Paul says, all I want to talk about is the gospel. Amen. All you want to know, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, this morning was Amen. the gospel. And so, from the gospel being introduced in the Garden of Eden, the animal being slain and Adam and Eve covered with the skins of the animal. Amen. Oh yes, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You see, brothers and sisters, I don't need men's philosophy. <laughs> because the book tells me the whole story. Amen. I recommend the book. I recommend the book, brothers and sisters. The book tells us that Adam and Eve had two children, Cain and, and Abel. And Cain inspired by the devil himself, killed his brother because his brother was faithful. They were told by their parents to bring animals and, and sacrifice uh, because the animals represented the gospel. My dear brothers and sisters, Abel brought the animals and sacrificed and representing the shed blood of Jesus, the good news of redemption, but Cain, he brought some luscious fruit, but they weren't acceptable to God. My dear brothers and sisters, if anyone is telling you anything else about the gospel that could bring you redemption, you need to reject them. I don't care what they call themselves and how many degrees they have behind their names or how many titles, but if they're not bringing to you the gospel, the gospel is the only light of the world. Everything else is, is darkness. I'm not politically correct. Pardon me, but I'm like Paul. I come not to you with excellency of speech or wisdom, but I come on to you and I'm determined to preach nothing else but uh, Jesus Christ and him crucified, resurrected, and coming again. My dear brothers and sisters, as the gospel story continues. We see as God raised up prophets, they would sacrifice animals. We, we see with, with the flood where men had gotten so wicked that God had to destroy them off the earth, save for Noah. The Bible tells us that once the flood receded, what did Noah do? He built an altar and he sacrificed unto God. Oh yes, the gospel. As time went on and God raised up a peculiar people that he had chosen to represent him to the world, to bring the gospel to the world. We know them as the Hebrews or the, the Jews, whatever you want to call them. Oh yes, that was their purpose. In the book of Isaiah, the 42nd chapter of the book of Isaiah, this is what the record says regarding the Jewish nation. It says, Thus said the Lord God that created the heavens and the earth, that stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the spirit to them that walk therein. This is what the Lord says. And I, the Lord, have called thee, the Jewish nation, in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee as a covenant for the people, for a light to the Gentiles. Oh yes, that's what the Jewish nation was raised up to do, is to bring the gospel of salvation to the world. As we continue the story, they were taken into Egyptian bondage and for over 400 years. You see, brothers and sisters, they were in bondage and to a great extent they lost their way. They forgot about the gospel, but we serve a God of mercy. And God raised up his servant Moses and sent him to deliver the Jewish people out of Egyptian bondage. And my dear brothers and sisters, as they came out of Egyptian bondage by the miracle working God hand of God and he brought them into Mount Sinai then 
God appeared to Moses and he says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even shall ye make it. In other words, God told Moses that there is a heavenly sanctuary. Oh yes, oh yes. And he says the earthly sanctuary that I want you to build, I want you to build it exactly according to the pattern that I would show you. And of course, Moses appealed to the people and got the talent and the funds to build the sanctuary. And in the sanctuary, God revealed the gospel, the plan of salvation. You see, David declares, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Let me just tell you a little bit about the sanctuary. You see, the sanctuary itself was a structure about 45 feet wide by 75 feet long. And it was enclosed in what they call the, the courtyard by a white linen, a, 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 a white linen cloth. Now, as people come into the sanctuary, they come from the outer court, uh, 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 from outside the sanctuary, as they come into the, the courtyard, you're coming through the whiteness represented the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because you, brothers and sisters, when we're out in the world and we hear the gospel, then we come to Jesus and the Bible says that he covers us with his righteousness and that's what the white curtain represented. As you come into the sanctuary, people that realize their sin you see, salvation is for only those that know that they have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus says that he has come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We are all sinners. But what Jesus was saying, if you think that there is no sin in you, you have no need for the gospel. But if you have need for the gospel, then you have come to the right place uh, at this morning. And so in the Jewish sanctuary, as a sinner realized that he had sinned, he would bring an animal. And he would bring it coming through the white curtain or coming into the outer court. And as he come, there's the altar of sacrifice where he would kill the animal. And the animal's blood would be spilled. I want to let you know that John and the River Jordan, when he saw Jesus, Coming to be baptized, he declared, Behold, uh, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And I'm sure that there were, Jew there were Jewish minds that made the connection at that time. What did they do after, they, after they, uh, the animal was slain? The priest would now wash his hands in the, in the laver where there was water. And then he would take the blood and take it into, the, into the, the, the holy place of the sanctuary. What did the water represent? The washing. It represented baptism. When we hear the gospel and we now come to Jesus, accept his sacrifice as represented by the animal, then the Bible says, he that believed and is baptized will be saved. And so the sanctuary now continues to preach the gospel. The priest would take the blood into the holy place, and there's so much more to this. I'm just giving you the, uh, the diluted version, well, not diluted, a shorter version, a quick version in the interest of time. And as you, he takes the blood and he goes into the holy place and he announces, uh, at the blood uh, on the altars. And then there was the bread as you coming to from the east to the west. And there was the table of show bread. What did it represent? The Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If any man eat of this bread, he would never hunger. And after the, on the right hand side, the table of show bread, then you come to the altar of incense. Paul tells us that the 
altar of incense represents our prayers as they are mixed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Oh yes, brothers and sisters, as we come to, to Jesus and are baptized, we want to study his word. We want to know more what he requires of us. We want to be praying and asking God to lead us and to, to guide us into all truth. And then as you come around to the left-hand side, there was the seven-branch candlestick that give it light in the sanctuary that Jesus would declare, I am the light of the world. If any man followeth me, he will not follow in darkness, but he would have the light of life. Oh yes, brothers and sisters, the ancient sanctuary and its services was an object lesson of God's love for us, his justice and his mercy. As the people performed the, the many rituals that they were required to, they were verily participating in the proclamation of the gospel. They were verily experiencing the power of the gospel, the good news. For you see, brothers and sisters, it wasn't the animals that were supposed to die, but it was the men and women that committed sin, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, represented by those animals. And so as we come to these closing scenes of Earth's history, God is calling men and women to embrace the gospel. You could only find the gospel in this book. You can't find the gospel anywhere else on planet Earth. They have tried to burn it. They have banned it. They have killed people that possessed it. But God promised that the flower faded and the grass wither it. But my word shall stand forever. The gospel, the gospel that still stands. I want you to know this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, that the Apostle Paul declares to us. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, I stand with Paul and I invite you to stand with me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. No other religious writing could claim that. Paul says, but it's for only those that believe. Only those that believe. So if it is salvation that you seek, if it is eternal life that you seek, Whatever you call yourself, I want to let you know this morning that the only solution is the gospel. For Paul says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Oh yes, we by, could live, we must live by faith, believing in what God says. I want you to know that the traditions of men or the pronouncements of ecclesiastical councils cannot save you. They have no power and they will not last, but the gospel, the good news of salvation will last forever. For Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. My dear brothers and sisters, the power of the gospel was expressed in the, the life of Peter and the apostles as Peter and John were arrested and taken before the, the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, and they were tried and warned against preaching the gospel, salvation in Jesus Christ. Oh, Peter who had not too long ago denied Christ, but had now embraced the gospel, Peter declared, neither is there salvation in any other, for is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. 
Oh, my dear brothers and sisters and the, and the very ones to whom he was brought for trial, the Bible declares that they looked upon Peter and then they declared. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they have been with Jesus Christ. I want to let you know that the, the gospel gives you boldness to, to preach and to teach the name of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul would declare, and I join voices with him, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may open, I may therein, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak in this morning. As I speak boldly to you, I ask you to embrace the gospel by God's grace. I know I'm a living witness the power of the gospel. Before this person that you're seeing and you're listening to today, for 12 years, parked on the wrong side of a crack cocaine pipe, I came from the beautiful land of Guyana, one of the poorest countries in the world and was brought up in one of the poorest neighborhoods and like most people around the world, always wanted to come to America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I made my way here. That's a long story. I'm not going to get into all the detail, but I do want you to know that I started out on the right track, began to seek out uh, education and do the right things, and, but I began and made some wrong decisions, and those decisions led me to drugs and to alcohol ending up the 12 years behind the crack cocaine pipe but praise God praise God someone came along and introduced the gospel and the rest is history and so here I am today as a living witness to you that the gospel works God is no respecter of persons and what he has done for me he will do for you but you have to experience, you have to accept the gospel. My dear brothers and sisters, the Bible, this precious book, this unique book that was written over a period of over 1,500 years by more than 40 men and women, of this book, which transcends all cultures, this book contains the gospel. I invite you to pick it up today and to read it and to study it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the very Holy Spirit that inspired men to write it would give you understanding. But you have to decide not to follow the tradition of men. You have to make a commitment to come to know Jesus. I want you to know that no other God or collection of gods, my brothers and sisters, could give you the gospel. It is what the world needs more than anything else. But the enemy is determined that the gospel should not be preached. But my Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world as a witness. Well, this morning, you're a witness to the preaching of the gospel, and you have a choice to make. And the choice is whether you would accept the gospel or reject it. There are no three ways. This is not a denominational thing. This is not a church thing. This is life, the issue of life. Because the Bible is clear that issue of life is death but the gift of God is eternal life the wages of sin is death and there's only one that has conquered death 
And that's my Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, Amen. the gospel. Amen. I give you the gospel today. The gospel, my brothers and sisters, is the most powerful building block for any nation, for any society. You see, it is the gospel that established this nation. Uh, because men and women that flee Europe from the traditions of the European ecclesiastical power, that had men in darkness, that's why it was called the Dark Ages. For this book tells me that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And when the word was taken away, there was nothing by darkness in the traditions of men. But praise God, he always, always has a witness. And so he raised up men like Wycliffe and, and Zwingli. Oh, and the famous of them all, Martin Luther. And as they began to preach the gospel, salvation by God's grace through faith in his son, the Jesus, the men and women, rich and poor, kings and princesses, they embraced the gospel and it brought the great Protestant Reformation which gave birth to this land that we call America. But as I shared with you as we come down to the closing scenes of Earth's history, the Bible tells us that there would be another period of dark ages right here in these United States because men and women would reject the gospel. Don't reject the gospel, my brother, my sister. The election is coming up and you might be debating and contemplating who you going to vote for. I can't tell you whether you should vote or not or who you should vote for, but what I can tell you is that the answer that you're seeking is in the gospel. Embrace the gospel today. The gospel is the story of Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters, the way in which we measure historical time is based on the gospel. We live in the year 2020 AD, after Christ. Those that lived before, two, three, four, five hundred years BC, before the gospel. I don't care what they say, what they call themselves. No one can escape the gospel. It doesn't mean that no one is going to reject it because the Bible is clear that millions upon millions have rejected and continue to reject the gospel. The reason I'm standing of before you today is because I don't want you to reject the gospel. I want you to embrace the gospel. Yes. The Bible tells us that as we come to the closing scenes of our history, as Jesus prophesied that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world as a witness, then shall the end come. John the Revelator declared in the book of Revelation, chapter 14. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. That's how wide and powerful the message of the gospel is going to be preached. That God had to give us the imagery of angels flying in the midst of heaven, brothers and sisters. You don't want to miss out. You don't want to miss out on that which you seek, which is eternal life. It comes only through the gospel. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the gospel from eternity past to eternity in the future. I showed you where the gospel was introduced to, to Adam and Eve. I showed you where it has been conceived before the world was created, before man sinned. God had the gospel prepared. And so John, on behalf of God, says that he saw this angel having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him.
for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him who made the heavenly earth and sea and the fountains of waters. I want you to know that Sabbath is the gospel. Oh yes, my dear brothers and sisters, and so God is calling you back to put aside the tradition of men in Sunday sacredness and embrace the gospel, embrace his Sabbath. The gospel will decimate, brothers and sisters, as we bring this to a close. The gospel will decimate every human invention, every ism that man has tried. Capitalism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Catholicism, Communism, Marxism. My Bible tells me that the gospel will decimate all the isms in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, as God gave a dream, I just love the way God operates. He chose a pagan king to give him the message of salvation, to give him the gospel. That's the God that we serve. And God gave Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, a dream, and he couldn't remember the dream, but praise God, God has its servants. The Babylon, the captives, the Jewish captives in Babylon, and, and Daniel, one of God's servants, was able to explain the dream to the king. And he told the king what he had dreamt, that he had dreamt the image of a great statue of the head of gold and the chest and the arms of silver and the belly of brass and the legs of, of iron and the feet of iron and clay. And then, and then, and then Daniel declared the gospel. For he said, and after all this, I saw a stone cut out from the heavens without hands, and it came and it crushed the image. The image representing the nations that will rule the world from uh, Daniel's time in Babylon to the day in which we live. Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, the Roman power. The mixture as we come to the end of time of iron and clay representing the amalgamation of false religion with the states, the time in which we live. And then Daniel declared. And in the days of these kings shall God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, whatever isms that there is out there. The gospel is going to decimate it. For he says that it will stand forever. For as much as thou sawest the stone that was cut out of the mountains without hands, the gospel. And that it will break into pieces the iron, the brass, and the clay, and the silver, and the gold. And the great God had made to the king what shall come to pass thereafter. And I love this. And the dream is certain. And the interpretation is true. We have the evidence because everything else that was prophesied has come to pass. We've shared that in previous messages. You could go back and look it up. And so Paul, Paul declares to us, he says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preached another gospel unto you, that which we have preached, let them be accursed. There is no other gospel. I want you to know that the gospel gives you peace in the midst of the storm of the coronavirus, in the midst of the storm in the fires of California, in the midst of the storm of the election season. The gospel gives you peace. I think of Jesus as he was on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples and Jesus having been preaching the gospel all day got tired and he resigned to rest in the belly of the boat and then a great storm the Bible tells us came about and as the, the, the sea waves rolled and the wilts billowed oh and the disciples they were scared they thought they were going to die and then 
And then the Holy Spirit brought to them the gospel. The gospel was asleep at the bottom of the boat and they called him and it's amazing how we operate. They didn't think of their fears and their weaknesses. They blamed Jesus. Don't you care that we perish? But he is so loving, he didn't retaliate. He came and he stood in the ship and he says, peace, be still. The gospel wants to speak peace to your heart today. And Jesus says, peace, I leave with you my peace, I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, and neither be afraid. The answer is still the gospel, my dear brothers and sisters. If you have embraced it, continue in it. Continue to study, continue to pray. Continue to allow it to transform your life. If you have never given your life to God, uh, uh, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, today you have another opportunity wherever you are. Just say, Lord, I give my life to you. I can't handle it. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Jesus is saying to you this morning, come on to me. All ye that labor and heavy laden, and I, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, you will find rest unto your souls. I present to you this morning the gospel. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your love and giving us the opportunity to hear the gospel. Thank you, dear Father, for giving me the opportunity to open my mouth and speak go boldly the mystery of the gospel. I pray that today some heart has been touched and someone, wherever they may be, whatever denomination, whatever religious affiliation, that they may hear the gospel and embrace the gospel, for it is our only hope. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the gospel. God bless and enjoy the rest of your Sabbath day, a blessing of the gospel. Amen. Amen.